will not. So um, just to, you know, if don't be afraid to ask your questions. If you know, if uh, if a recording sounds intimidating, that's not what's going to happen in the Q and A. Um, so thank you. Yeah, Marcus also shared uh, the shortcuts in the chat um, to raise your hand uh, through Zoom. Um, so it's um, you can find them there. Um, and yeah, if you have any technical questions, you can also ask those and we try our best to resolve any issue that is going on. Um, and again, it's amazing to see all of you here on week four, I mean, week five Oxford time, but week four on this seminar. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're, it's, it's keeping on well and we're very excited to continue with the talks. Uh, so maybe I'll hand over to Marcus to introduce our amazing speakers this week now. Great, so it's totally my pleasure this week to introduce our speakers. Um, uh, just before I do that, I, I would note that we're gonna have, plan to have a break again, um, just around kind of five to uh, six uh, GMT or, or around 6 p.m. Uh, and it should be kind of a shorter break again this week of around five minutes. Um, so yes, um, First up tonight, we're going to have uh, Mara Gold. Uh, Mara is a DPhil candidate in classical languages and literature based at St Hilda's College, Oxford. Mara's interests uh, lie in women's education history, uh, theatre history and the reception of Greek comedy, female homosociality and the influence of the ancient world on women's concepts of gender, sexuality and feminism. Her PhD thesis looks at classics and performing identity in British women's colleges from 1890 to 1930. She has a particular interest in queer nostalgia and heritage, as well as queer archiving and curating practices. She's the co-convener of the Oxford Queer Studies Network based at Torch uh, and is on the steering committee for the Queer Research UK, so QR UK. Alongside her DPhil, Mara is involved in museum and heritage sectors most recently working at the research assistant on the Beyond the Binary project at the Pitt Rivers Museum, funded by NHLF. She has a postgrad degree in advanced theatre practice, archaeology and modern British and European history. She's recently published on women's reception on the ancient Egypt in early 20th century Britain, and is contributing to a forthcoming publication on the reception of Greek and Roman sexualities. Emily Rutherford is a history of gender and sexuality in modern Britain and a junior research fellow at Merton College, Oxford. She received her PhD in history from Columbia University in 2020, and she's working on two book projects, a history of gender relations in British universities between 1860 and 1935, and an intellectual history of male homosexuality in England circa 1850 to 1967. Her previous research has dealt centrally with queer history and classical reception, and she has published articles about the early theorist of male homosexuality, John Addington Simmons, and about the Greek lecturer and textbook writer, Arthur Sidgwick. Jennifer Inglehart is professor of Latin and currently head of department at Durham University, where she has taught since 2004. She has published widely on Latin love poetry, and more recently on the ways in which Roman sexuality has influenced modern thinking about sexuality. She's also interested in underground books, which could not be published openly because of their sexual content, and explored this area as a curator of a 2018 to 2019 display at the Story of Phi at the Bodleian Library. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Mara, who's gonna go our first provocation before we move to Emily, and then there'll be a response from Jennifer. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mara. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just gonna put my PowerPoint up here. Um, sorry, it's not the greatest PowerPoint and I haven't labeled all the archives. So if anyone wants some information about the particular images, do, um, do let me know. I'm just going to play from start. Could someone indicate whether they can see the slideshow? We good? We can see. Okay, cool. Great. All right. So I'm going to get started. Um, as Marcus mentioned, my uh, DPhil research is on classics and performing identity um, from kind of 1890 to 1930, although it's a bit of wiggle, wiggle room there. Um, and the, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of based on, I guess, some of my, uh, the, the problems I've encountered um, doing my uh, DPhil thesis, um, particularly in how, how I want to frame things. Um, so it's not an entirely 
queer thesis, you know, I'm looking at women's educational history, etc. Um, but I soon noticed there was a, you know, massive queer element to it. Um, and initially, I was very, very keen on kind of labeling things as, as lesbian, um, you know, because I was sort of trying to fight back against maybe some of the historians that were just, oh, no, they're just friends, they didn't have lesbians, etc, etc. Um, but I soon realized that uh, was not, in fact, the correct Thing to do. Um, so I wanted to start off basically just talking a bit about kind of the problem with um, lesbian history before I start offering some solutions. And as you can see from the title, that solution today is going to be sapphism or kind of sapphic culture. Um, so, you know, as, as, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you, it's obviously very important um, to include the history of women who love women. Um, it's often, you know, really overlooked in favor of gay men's history, um, which in some ways, I'm not saying all some ways, is kind of easier to find in terms of there being more published writers, that there, there being actual laws against um, male homosexual uh, sex and that sort of thing. So, you know, you've got court cases, etc. So sometimes you do have to prod a little bit harder, you know, to find those histories. Um, but despite your efforts over kind of the past, I guess, sort of 40 years, um, no one can really actually agree on, on what to label these kind of queer women's or, or um, people assigned female at birth, you know, their, what their orientation or gender identity actually was, you know, for example, was Radcliffe Hall a trans man, was Sappho a lesbian? You know, these are questions that we're probably never gonna be able to answer. Um, but the biggest kind of question roadblock when it comes to this kind of history is this constant question of, were they lesbians or were they really close friends? Uh, and it's kind of become a joke in the lesbian community, um, often referred to as just gals being pals um, and things like that. And you know, unsurprisingly, it's often the heterosexual historians interpreting these kind of intimate relationships as perfectly innocent and normal for the time period, whilst the queer historians tend to be a bit more generous about their kind of sexual maturity or lack of innocence in a way. And so as a lesbian historian myself, slash, well, lesbian historian slash classicist, um, I'm constantly being questioned about and having to question my own um, biases. You know, am I reading into something that doesn't exist just because I want it to? Um, but, you know, are heterosexual historians really held up to the same standards? Well, maybe in the past, no. I'm hoping that this is changing, um, kind of with the introduction of gender and queer studies to the canonical cur curriculum. Um, you know, whilst I obviously want to acknowledge and confront my own biases, um, biases on the other hand, um, I do think that kind of my lesbian biases can give me an advantage in some ways to kind of see signs that might be missed by, you know, a straight um, heterosexual historian. And, you know, in fact, it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize I was actually um, doing a PhD about myself 100 years ago. Um, I discovered my sexuality through the study of classics, found my first girlfriend in Greek class, and I still have my textbook annotated with classical um, and queer in-jokes, much like the ones I find in the archive, um, you know, from 100 years ago. So, but it's really my classical training that's kind of the key to understanding and, and interpreting uh, this kind of queer archi archival material, um, at least material pertaining to kind of the educated upper and middle, uh, middle and upper classes. The problem is, you know, the, the, there isn't a huge number of people who have the training in classical languages, the expertise in modern history, and kind of a, a queer eye, so to speak. I'm sure there's probably a few of those uh, with us today, but <laughs> there's not so many, you know, around the world, I guess. Um, and, you know, even if these kind of uh, relationships that I'm going to be talking about are not necessarily considered queer in their own context. Um, it still fits within the remit of queer studies um, because, you know, it, whilst queer didn't have the same connotations as it does now, that, um, although there are, um, you know, many instances, instances of, of students kind of explaining their feelings towards or their crushes on um, their lecturers particularly as queer, not necessarily meaning the same thing, but I just think it's interesting that those words are, are actually, you know, that word is actually used. Um, in that instance as well. Um, so I'm just going to move on now to, I guess, sapphism as a solution. So um, first of all, I guess we need to consider the meaning of queer today, particularly in an academic context. Um, you know, some people still have a problem with that word being used, particularly when you're doing outreach work outside academia. Um, but it's particularly useful for the work I'm undertaking because we can't necessarily equate it with modern lesbianism, but it certainly wasn't heteronormative. So I think queer is kind of an acceptable um, and useful word to use within this kind of academic setting, uh, setting for unpicking how these women labeled or at least saw themselves. Um, today, the word sapphic has kind of made a comeback actually as a sort of an umbrella term for women who love women, whether they be lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, etc. 
Um, you know, and now also I've got to admit in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, you know, sapphic didn't, didn't have the same def definition necessarily, but I have found it to be the most useful label um, to use for the time period and especially for women's educational spaces. Um, and here's why. So <clears throat> the first of all, I got to say, there's a number of uh, words that women were using at the time to describe their not straight identities, whether that be sapphist, sapphic, lesbian, lesbian with a capital L as in citizens of Lesbos, um, also Uranian, which was kind of a, um, almost a kind of LGBTQ umbrella term, it would seem, um, which are all related to the classical world. Um, you know, there are obviously certainly legitimate ways to do queer history that might use other labels or definitions, but for the purpose of my work, I'm going to be specifically looking at Safism um, and it's, as its own distinct identity and culture. Now, Mary Beard argues that, um, so there's, a, there's this question over Jane Harrison, the classicist, um, kind of late, uh, late 19th century kind of classicist, over whether she was a lesbian or not, there's a lot of arguments about it. Um, Mary Beard kind of argues against this kind of Jane Harrison was a lesbian theory. But she does argue that Virginia Woolf saw their relationship as erotic simply because she referred to their shared residence as a sapphic flat um, and reviewed Hope Merlais, uh, one of her kind of intimate friends, writing as all sapphism, saying they were kind of billing and cooing together. <clears throat> but I'm arguing here that Virginia's definition of sapphic is a lot more complex than that um, and it's not necessarily erotic. And so um, kind of stemming from women's colleges, it appears to have referred to a particular kind of intellectual and artistic relationship or even something kind of akin to feminism, um, or at least an alternate as an alternative to heteronormativity. Um, for example, in this quote by Catherine Mansfield, um, who was kind of sapphic herself, um, the modern soul, whether the modern soul is introspecting about her place in the world uh, in terms of kind of her independence, her literary proclivities, and she calls herself curiously sapphic. And this is just one example um, where this kind of word comes up in that kind of situation where it's not necessarily referring to kind of sexual um, identity. <coughs> Apologies. Um, and we've also got to remember there's a difference between the word sapphist as a noun and kind of sapphic as an adjective, which seems to kind of have a broader definition. Um, and so, you know, Virginia Woolf used the sapphist in terms of V to Sackville West and some of the other friends. Um, but interestingly, um, when she published A Room of One's Own, which was just a year after The Well of Loneliness and the big trial around that, um, she was worried that she was going to appear as a feminist and a sapphist. Um, and I think it's really interesting that she specifically used sapphist because, you know, that book has came from her time at and her the kind of address she gave at the Oxford, uh, sorry, the Cambridge uh, Women's Colleges. So that the fact that she kind of thought it was almost too sapphic or to, it seemed to appear to be, you know, a, a writing of a sapphist um, because it was based around this kind of college environment, I think really says something about, you know, how their interpretation of it. So um, I'm going to get talk a little bit um, about Jane Harrison. She's not the main focus of, of my talk or of, of my thesis, you know, in part because she's very well researched and published on before, but I really want to acknowledge the influence she had on women's college culture as one of the kind of earliest students at Newnham and one of the kind of, uh, and also as a highly influential, uh, influential lecturer at Newnham and also probably the most famous female academic of her time and certainly one of the most famous classicists of the time, male or female. I'm not sure if anyone had a chance to read the little snippet from uh, Hearst's Woman's World, um, but basically um, Harrison wrote this article in Woman's World, which was published by Oscar Wilde um, about basically women's colleges being a sapphic community. So, you know, despite having excellent working relationships with and maybe romantic feelings towards men, um, Harrison recognized the importance of all female communities and she did her best to set a foster a sapphic style community of her own. And not only did she stage rituals such as Greek games, so she's kind of running into the dining hall dressed up in Greek clothes, um, starting, you know, trying to do this opening ceremony. This one is, is an example from Barnard College in the US that the Newnham ones weren't quite as elaborate, but this is the kind of kind of thing that was going on. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, and she also conducted intimate relationships with students, um, referring to them as kind of husband and wife. She'd send them notes asking them to meet her in her cave, which was her study that was kind of connected to, um, and calling herself a bear, which was connected to uh, a story relating to Artemis. Um, and 
And Harrison herself described women's colleges as modern Sapphic communities and that women have been deprived of for centuries. And she prizes an intellectual component in her relationship with women, which I argue was central to the types of intimate relationships between women um, at the colleges and was based on the Sapphic model. So I'm just gonna read a little quote from the uh, article that she wrote in 1888 in the Women's World. These lesbian women had their clubs in which they developed to the full that peculiar form of social enjoyment which comes to women from the society of women only. But the true social instinct among women is reviving, thanks largely to the impulse of collegiate life. It is possible now to ask a dozen women to meet without the melancholy conviction that one half will bore and the other will be bored. Women, we are told, are not clubbable. Well, who knows? They were in Sappho's days. One thing is certain, a woman who does not know the joy of meeting a chosen few, her college friends, her own elect, at a well-appointed feast, Sappho herself loved things delicate, has a fine sensation yet to try. It is a joy that man, with his keener and healthier flair for pleasure, has ever been careful to secure, this privilege to keep some social unions for their own sex alone. So for camaraderie, for all absolute relaxation of social strain, for all keen unflinching conflict of wits, we will do as the lesbian women did, have our women's clubs. And Virginia Woolf kind of echoes a similar sentiment even into the kind of the twenties. Um, so what is the Sapphic model? Well, as obviously as we all know, <laughs> the long history of the classical world featuring in both male homosexual and men's college culture. Uh, there's a long history of, of using Sappho in ancient Greek as a code for lesbianism, um, as well as the use of ancient Greek terms to express uh, women's desire due to the freedoms it allowed them. We've got some example, clear examples from the 18th and 19th centuries, just quick, um, of Anne Lister's diary, which was coded in Greek and algebra. I'm um, sorry, I'm waving my hand a bit much there. Um, and we also have um, the artist Anne Damer, who was known as kind of a Sappho. This article was printed in the late 18th, uh, 18th century here. Um, so it's already being used. Um, and there are many references in the archive for the late 19th and early 20th century of using Greek to express feelings because it was the only suitable language to do so in. Even for people that weren't that closeted, Vita Sackville West, HD, those kinds of people, they also said this. Um, so women's colleges kind of uh, looking at women's colleges as a place for young women's development and more than that kind of just a, a, um, more than just a place of education. They're an alternative to heteronormative domesticity and offered intellectual, cultural and emotional development. Um, although we don't know a huge amount of Sappho's about Sappho's life, there's this kind of general idea that Sappho ran kind of poetry school which in the Victorian and Edwardian eras was very popular and kind of sometimes romanticized. And this became the ideal for many intellectual women, not, um, not just in a, as a place of, work, of learning, but a community of women who loved um, and cared for one another. So, um, you know, Sappho obviously wasn't the only inspiration from the ancient world. There's other homosocial groups like, um, for example, Maynards, that's at Smith College, um, Amazons and Furies. Um, this was a play put on, it was a, um, a parody of Euripides' Furies um, called The Humanities about a lazy male undergraduate and basically saying how much better women were. <laughs> Um, and similarly, women's colleges were often compared to and often compared themselves to um, the Greek chorus, for example. This is a depiction from Girton College in the 30s, um, sent to class as a Snorra Jolliffe. Um, so I just want to move on to now the, uh, the types of sapphic relationships that we're kind of seeing within the women's colleges. Um, so first of all, there are kind of students, um, relationships between students, and they are kind of definitely very much learning based relationships, especially classics There's all these examples of learning Greek together, reading Greek together, and that person becoming your kind of intimate special friend through that study of classics. A lot of Sappho related notes that were um, passed. This is one um, that was in the US that, that came with um, a, an envelope of pubic hair and a kind of it's a bit of a saucy note that was written. Um, there's, uh, you know, Valentine's notes, um, as this one at Girton. There were college husbands and wives. There was this kind of hierarchy, definitely, between older and younger students and kind of mentor-mentee relationships. And these are also portrayed in fiction, like uh, Sweet Girl Graduate. And I think these are the kinds of relationships that Sharon Marcus is referring to when she's talking about them kind of almost using this to prepare for sort of heterosexual life. Um, and, you know, or, or what we might call these days a lug, which is a lesbian until graduate. Um, but there are many that kind of chose, I guess, I don't know whether to use the word chose, but we'll talk about that shortly, this lifestyle permanently. 
um, they, they would remain at the women's colleges for most of their lives, transitioning from student to tutor and perpetuating Sapphic culture. Now there were student teacher relationships. So Jane Harrison again had several relationships with different students. Um, again, not exactly sure the nature of them. Um, but there were also inti yeah, intimate relationships between other students and academic staff. For example, um, Eva Gladstone in the 1880s at Newnham, always talking about um, her vice principal coming to her bedroom and kissing her and using kisses as a reward and punishment um, and how much she liked it and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and you know, in her diaries, um, got uh, Marjorie Fry, originally Somerville, Birmingham, um, then Birmingham uh, engaged in relationship with the student Marjorie Rick's, Rackstraw. Um, the vice principal at St. Hughes, Jordan, was um, fit in famously having kind of relationships with, um, with younger students. Um, and I'm not really sure what to call this yet. I'm, I'm kind of tentatively situating it as a sort of modern uh, female pederasty, although obviously it's not the same thing. Um, and there wasn't always a huge age gap in these situations, I've got a, um, uh, I should say. Um, you know, often there was only kind of a few years between them, um, even if they were vice principal, you know, because a lot of them would just, as I said, stay on and, and stay teaching as soon as they finished. Um, and so the other thing also is that um, there, there probably were kind of fewer boundaries between academic staff and students then. Um, in the early days of women's colleges, they kind of considered themselves to be more kind of familial. Um, and some colleges like St. Hilda's purposely built the college buildings to look more like a house. Um, and so many, academic, many of the academics kind of focus more on pastoral care um, and college life than on publishing. So we have a surprisingly large number of female classicists in particular who had major impacts on the students and student life and college life, but were omitted from the historical record just because, you know, they didn't publish, so we don't know about them. And then finally, uh, relationships between um, academic staff. And so this category is probably the most numerous, or at least there's the most evidence for, because a lot of them, as they got older, as the years went by, would, would go back and say, yeah, well, what's it come out, basically. Um, so we've got this kind of information for them. Um, you know, they, they were quite common and quite long lasting relationships. There's plenty of evidence for it. Um, so one again, oh, this is, oh, sorry, I missed that before. This is another student uh, teacher relationship, Edith Hamilton, the classicist um, with Doris Reed. And then, yeah, back to um, staff. So this is um, from St. Hughes, Principal Charlotte Mobley and um, Ellen Jourdain. They're in this lifelong relationship. They published this crazy book about time travel and ghosts at Versailles and people knew about them. There's a lot of writing about them being in this kind of, you know, a sexual relationship um, at the time. Um, you've got uh, another example of, you know, at Somerville, Marjorie Fry and Rose Sidgwick, a librarian, assistant librarian. They both went to Birmingham as well after. And then we've got um, Carolyn Spurgeon from Bedford. This is, I stole this from Emily Rutherford's blog, this picture. Um, and Virginia Gildersleeve at Barnard. Um, and they were responsible for founding the International Federation of University Women. So you can see some of these people engaged in these kind of sapphic relationships were, you know, really at the top of the game and really influential in terms of women's education. Um, and there's some examples in the US, I'm not going to go through them because we're running out of time, but I'd like, I'd like to show this one. This is called The Honeymoon Album. It's from 1905. This is two academics um, from uh, Barnard as well. Um, and so, you know, you've got this, you've got Carol Diehouse, you know, calling them things like lifelong spinsters, etc. in her book in 1995, No Distinction of Sex, but come on, I mean, really. Um, there's just so much, and I won't go into all the evidence now, but I um, can obviously talk about it more later. Um, sorry, almost finished, don't worry. Um, but we've also, I just also wanted to note that we've got examples that are using the same kind of model um, that, are, you know, outside of colleges as well. So um, it's just more, so I'm just showing pictures now. Um, and for example, Edith Craig, Christopher St. John and Claire Atwood, they kind of created their own little sapphic community, the three of them, and they collaborated together um, on work. And so, yeah, so both inside and outside of women's colleges, these intellectual and literary sapphics often operated on a mentor-mentee basis, or they involved some kind of sapphic hierarchy, um, which often had like a spirit, uh, spiritual element. So Jen Harrison says, if I had been rich, I should have founded a learned community for women with vows of consecration and a beautiful rule and habit. Um, and you've got people, again, like Elsa Gidlow, the poet in the US, um, creating her own spiritual kind of sapphic circle. You've got Natalie Barney, Renee Vivian, Judah Barnes, all that lot, again, having this kind of spiritual sapphic circle and, and uh, adding a spiritual element to 
that and I think that was definitely present at the colleges as well um so yeah just on to I'm going to just kind of nearly at the end there, an example of a tombstone using this kind of the, a quote they thought was Sappho that wasn't, but still, life that is love is God, and, and kind of referring to their relationship. So in terms of Saf, uh, Safism as a framework, well, I mean, how, how, how am I using this? Obviously, I need to keep it in mind um, when interpreting archival material, you know, um, in terms of understanding. at it as kind of the feminine, I don't really like using the feminine feminine of whatever, but I'm using it now, of the platonic model. Hi Mara, can you can you hear us? I think we've just lost you a little bit. Yeah, I think we might have lost we might have lost Mara. Um, we'll just we'll drop her a message just separately just to see if um, she's able to like get back uh, onto the Zoom, and we'll give that just a, maybe a minute um, to see if we can get that working and up and running. That's away with everyone. Thank you. Right, we're just dropping an email to Mara now, um, just to see if how she's doing with the Wi-Fi connection. Um, what might be a suggestion if she does have a tough time getting back on the Wi-Fi is maybe we could move. Um, sorry, this is me on another account. Um, I am... My Zoom has collapsed. Um, can I just use your phone? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm just going to borrow this phone, and I'm just going to continue on this phone here but that's okay that's that's cool thank you <laughs> sorry so really sorry about that so no um, the last part is saying it was kind of yeah this female version of this platonic model practiced at the oxbridge men's colleges um and also if anyone's looked at linda dowling's uh hellenism and homosexuality in victorian oxford again it's kind of this woman's version of that um so how does this apply to arch archival material uh, within women's colleges well the key component really is deciphering sapphic code which i call it which involves decoding references to Sappho, uses of ancient Greek, classics, jokes, and other references to the ancient world um, with the, this kind of separate framework in mind. Um, rather than just kind of writing um, everything off as just gals being pals and not bothering to, sorry, I'm just moving this phone so I can see, there we go. Um, as just gals being pals and not bothering to truly decode um, the classical references, either because the person interpreting the material doesn't understand them, or they assume these references are purely intellectual instead of an expression of desire. Um, so we must consider the fact that the sapphic framework is an inextricable combination of intellectual, cultural, and emotional development. This again can be applied outside women's colleges. I won't talk about that now, but feel free to question me about it after. Um, and you can kind of see this in, um, in, in the drama performances I'm working on at the moment, particularly comedy performances. I'll just mention one which is The Bees, um, which is based on Aristophanes, The Birds, um, and it's about creating this women's college in the sky where they can receive degrees, because at Cambridge in 1904, when they put this on, they cannot receive degrees, and in fact, they didn't receive them until 1949, and it was 1920 in Oxford. So they put this play on, um, and there's just these constant references. They do not want to be in the general university. They don't want to be mixed with the men. Their, their utopia is Girton, like that is, they just want this women's environment, all they want is degrees. So they're really, really kind of hammering home this idea that they want this women's community. It's not about sharing things with men um, and all that sort of thing. And again, at, um, in the same year, actually, at Somerville, they put on a, a production called Demeter, which was staged by Marjorie Fry and Rose Sidgwick, who I mentioned before, who, who Emily, I'm sure knows quite a bit about. <laughs> and they put on a production of Demeter, 
And that was kind of themed around the anxieties of education for women and the tension between that and family and domestic life. Um, and again, obviously in a positive light, showing how you know, the, these women's educational environments are extremely important. Um, so just to kind of um, finish up, why am I talking about this? Well, there's an alternative category to the very binary friends or lovers. Um, you know, we don't know if all these relationships were sexual, some of them were, but to me, I, I don't think it matters because they were in committed, often lifelong relationships with each other. Um, it was certainly something more than casual. Many of them chose to live together for life, to be buried together. They received condolence cards in the same way a widow would when, when you know, a partner died. And so as well as connoting women who loved women, using sapphic as a framework acknowledges an intellectual element, which was at the heart of these relationships. That's not to say they weren't lesbian or similar relationships outside of this context, which might have had another more appropriate label, but I'm trying to define these particular relationships as having importance to queer history and to women's education history, as well as wider women's history. Um, these are consciously non-heteronormative relationships and therefore come under the remit of queer studies, yet they're so often ignored or played down, as I said, as friendships or not examined further. So there's one last thing I want to say, which is we have to think about this question of choice. You know, most of the students chose to be in the women's college as opposed to focusing on finding a husband, finishing school, etc., even if just temporarily. But it comes a little bit more diff difficult to understand the motivation of academic staff. Did they choose a women's college because um, of the academic life or, or because of the homosocial, homosexual aspect or both? Did they enter into intimate friendships with women because it wasn't possible for them to pursue heteronormative domesticity as academics? And did they become academics in order to conduct same-sex relationships with ease? But does the motivation to behind it really matter if they were contentedly living and working in Sapphic communities for most of their lives. I'm not sure, I'm still thinking about that. Um, similarly, whether or not these historic women were having sex, that doesn't matter, it could have been homosexual, homosocial, asexual, celibate, whatever, or any other orientation. But the fact that they were um, kind of committed to each other within specifically Sapphic communities and often for life is the key factor here. They were living non-heteronormative lifestyles in those women's homosocial communities, whether by choice, innate desire, or necessity. And that model is something that should be acknowledged in women's uh, education history, classical reception, and queer studies. And, and that's that. Sorry, I rambled much longer than I thought, but um, there we go. And the rest of the slideshow was just a couple of um, uh, screenshots from the, uh, the bees, the play. So it's not, not overly exciting, but I can send it to anyone who's, who's interested. Cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mara, for that amazing presentation and with all that incredible detail about um, the kind of history of those lives at colleges. Um, let's hand over then to a, our second speaker, um, uh, Emily Rutherford. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you to Marcus and Eleonora for curating such an incredible seminar and being such wonderful chairs. I think it's really, really impressive. Um, so, in this paper, I'm going to make two deliberately provocative points, um, both of which emerge from my disciplinary background as a historian of 19th and 20th century Britain. First, following on from points that actually many previous speakers in this seminar now have raised, queer subject matter and methods do not necessarily offer us the radical liberatory visions or any ready identification with queer pasts that we may come to them looking for. Second, it is long past time for scholars of classical reception to work collaboratively with modern historians in understanding how queer desires, relationships, and institutions have shaped the construction of classics as an academic discipline. For the purposes of this talk, I want to elucidate these points by telling you a story that's extremely relevant to why we're all here today under the auspices of the Corpus Classics Seminar. The story of how, in the early 20th century, a reactionary and misogynistic vision of pedagogic pederasty shored up Corpus Christi College Oxford's identity as a classic-centric institution. And this story is probably well known to many of you, though I'm sure not all, and I hope that it will gain in being told on this occasion by a historian who will situate it in the wider context of higher education, gender, and sexuality in 20th century Britain. So I'm gonna tell the story and then I'm gonna come back to my two provocative points at the end. So the story begins with an agreement between two unlikely allies. The first, Thomas Case, was the president of Corpus at the turn of the 20th century, a philosopher by training and a leading conservative voice in two of the biggest internal political debates of the time, whether and on what terms the University of Oxford would admit women as members, and whether it would drop so-called compulsory Greek as a matriculation requirement. 
to case there was something special about the idea of a society of men who all resided together in a collegiate environment and who shared a body of knowledge and cast of mind grounded in ancient languages. He stood firm throughout debates about women's degrees in the 1890s, rejecting a variety of compromise proposals. He took the same approach to compulsory Greek, chairing the Committee for the Preservation of Greek from 1904 until its ultimate defeat in 1920, hosting meetings in the Corpus President's lodgings, funding its administrative costs, and representing the campaign in the press, even as it came to be seen increasingly out of touch. To Case, Greek was worth defending unrelentingly because it was the cornerstone of learning, high culture, and a liberal education. But as public opinion moved against compulsory Greek, it became increasingly clear that his vision was a countercultural lost cause. In 1907, during a lull in the middle of the compulsory Greek controversy, Case received an inquiry from the second of our partners in crime, Edward Perry Warren. Warren was a Harvard graduate from a wealthy Boston family who had come to Oxford for a second undergraduate degree in 1883, which was a kind of cultural credentialing common among elite Americans, even before it was institutionalized through the establishment of the Rhodes Scholarships in 1902. And when he was at Oxford, Warren fell in love with the university and with his fellow student, John Marshall. Warren and Marshall went into business together as art dealers. They traveled often to Europe to buy Greek and Roman antiquities, which they then sold on to museums. They co-owned a house in Lewis in Sussex, which they filled with two collections, of young men whom they hoped to interest in the art world, and of the largest body of ancient art depicting same-sex sex ever to be assembled. And Jen Grove, who's at the University of Exeter, wrote a really wonderful dissertation about that collection, which I commend to everyone's attention, not only about that collection, but about collecting and including that collection. Um, so working with Oxford academics, such as the archaeologist John Beasley, Warren used his collection to advance academic understanding of ancient sexuality. Scholars had previously thought that idealized non-physical admiration of beauty was characteristic of the forms of desire older men expressed for younger men or boys in ancient Greece. But through cataloging his Greek vases, Warren found that in early classical Athens, vases very often depicted explicit sexual acts between older and younger men or boys. He argued that scholars needed to place sex at the center of their understanding of the institution of ancient pederasty. In privately printed writings, which probably circulated among a small sympathetic audience, he went a step further, claiming that the sexual relations of the early classical period were more virile than the effeminate, chaste pederastic relationships that authors such as Plato valorized later. But also that age unequal pederastic relationships were the best way to organize same-sex sexual relations in the present. To Warren, it was imperative to remake 20th century Britain in the image of this Hellenic masculinity. So he had initially tried to do this at Lewis, but when John Marshall decided to marry Warren's cousin, Warren felt betrayed. He felt folded up the collecting operation, and he concluded that monastic Oxford might be a better site for his ideal masculine environment. In 1907, determining that he could not afford to found an entirely new college to put his vision into practice, but would have to work together with the like-minded head of an extant foundation, he reached out to Case to suggest a collaboration. Warren's connections to homoerotic social circles, the nature of his domestic arrangements at Lewis, and his interest in sexually explicit art were all common knowledge, but there is no evidence to suggest that Case shared Warren's proclivities. More important was that Warren, like Case, thought women an unnatural intrusion upon Oxford, the relaxation of celibacy requirements in the 1870s, the first step in a long decline that would see the university feminized and classical languages and literatures dethroned. Case's greatest strength as a college head was as a fundraiser, born in part of his conviction that only with financial independence from the state would universities also maintain academic freedom. In the years before the First World War, he succeeded in attracting several major donors to Corpus to fund fellowships, scholarships, and capital projects. Most of these donations did not have any particular political edge, largest endowed fellowships in modern languages. But the circumstances of Case's agreement with Warren were different. The college's popular Greek fellow, Arthur Sidgwick, had recently retired, leaving a void in both classics teaching provision and the college community. There was thus an opportunity to revitalize classics teaching at Corpus, and in so doing, to make a political statement. Sidgwick had been the Oxford Women's Degrees Campaign's most committed male activist, literally the most committed, but Case and Warren both, for different reasons, wanted Greek at Corpus to stand for masculine exclusivity. By 1911, Warren provisionally committed to donating a third of the residue of his estate to Corpus. In gratitude, Case made Warren an honorary fellow, which entitled him to rooms in college. 
Warren, by now in his 50s, delighted in college life. Corpus alumni magazines from 1914 to 1918 are bizarre documents. Half obituaries of 20-year-olds, half reports from Warren and a few foreign students on the book club and the literary society. As casualties mounted, elite young men became an ever more valuable commodity in the eyes of those like Warren who thought pederasty a valuable social institution. Maintaining intimate and secluded homosocial space within England could seem more challenging than ever and fraught with social and political urgency. Furthermore, the end of the war saw the defeat of cases in Warren's camp. In 1920, when Oxford both admitted women to degrees and abolished compulsory Greek, Cases and Warren's masculine classic centric corpus was definitely no longer a possible future for the university, but they could still leverage the decentralized Oxford college system and private benefaction to perpetuate older ways of doing things within the college. All of this may have prompted Warren to introduce more conditions upon the use to which his money could be put. In 1927, he added a new clause to his will which both narrowed and doubled down upon his contribution to corpus. He outlined a bequest of 30,000 pounds, which was equivalent, which is equivalent to a purchasing power of 1.3 million pounds today. And that, that doesn't sound like a lot of money for a major bequest to an educational institution today, but it, it was a lot of money at that time, um, sort of proportionally. And he wrote in his will, quote, because the founder of Corpus Christi College desired that Greek should be studied therein, and the college has distinguished itself in the study of Greek and in the defense thereof. Therefore, I direct my trustees to pay 30,000 pounds for the purposes of the establishment and endowment of a prelectorship or lectureship. The prelector was to teach Greek and Latin with a preference for Greek. He was only to teach students from Corpus and never to do so, quote, in the presence of any woman. He was only to teach within the walls of the college and must live within them as well, quote, it being my special desire that the prelector and the members of the college receiving his instruction shall as far as possible be in close contact and associate together. Needless to say, quote, no woman shall at any time be eligible for the prelectorship. Case had resigned the presidency due to ill health in 1924 and died the following year. So by the time that Warren made this bequest, um, Case's successor, Percy Allen, was in the position Allen was a historian and archivist, an expert on the Renaissance humanism in connection with which Corpus had been founded in the 16th century. As president, he remained focused on his research and does not seem to have had much involvement in university politics. Perhaps seeing Warren's support of Greek as connected with the college's humanist heritage, instead of with a 20th century reaction against modern subjects, Allen warmly welcomed Warren's will. In November 1927, he wrote to Warren in gratitude for his, quote, munificent benefactions, which will surely strengthen the cause of classical learning. Going on to quote Erasmus, he situated Warren in a narrative of Corpus's centuries-long association with humanism. But one thing did present problems for Allen. In his will, Warren had also proposed a fund for the construction of an underground tunnel, linking the college's original site to buildings that had recently acquired on the other side of Merton Street. So for those who know the geography, that's what used to be called new building and is now I think called the Oldham building or something. And, um, and so it's a sort of a diagonal line going from the main site of Corpus to, to new building. He had insisted in letters to Allen that the tunnel was integral to the vision of classically oriented college community, his bequest hoped to enshrine. If it, were, if it were necessary for space reasons to house the prelector in the new buildings, the tunnel would mean that he and his students could easily reach each other at any time, even at night after the front gates were shut. Warren had made clear that he would withdraw the bequest if the college did not begin construction of the tunnel. In further conversations with Allen, Warren elaborated upon his vision of the role the prelector would play in reviving a nostalgic vision of an intimate gender segregated collegiate community. While the position need not have a marriage bar, Warren would prefer an unmarried man. While the prelector might occasionally lecture for the university, Warren preferred that the bulk of the position be one-on-one -on -one college tutorial teaching. Even in an era when colleges locked their gates at sundown in order to keep their students away from pubs and mixed company, Warren's insistence on facilitating access between the bedrooms of teachers and students at night seems unusual. Given the centrality of sex between men in antiquity to Warren's conception of high culture, art, and elite educational institutions, it is likely that he imagined pederasty might play a part in the vision of classics that he sought to endow at Corpus. Why does this never seem to have been an issue for Case or Allen? As public school and Oxford educated men with good working knowledge of classical languages and literatures, 
they would not have been naive about the homoerotic significance of Warren's many appeals to antiquity, nor about the ways in which managing single-sex schools and religious this period entailed a careful dance between tacit acceptance of and policing of same-sex intimacy. The interwar press enjoyed nothing more than a sex scandal, and had they taken an interest in Warren's social circle or his privately circulated writings in defense of pederasty, they could easily have created a scandalous narrative injurious to Corpus's reputation. It seems likely then that Case and Allen decided that it was worth the risk to turn a blind eye to Warren's proclivities, take his money, award him an honorary fellowship, and welcome him into residence at Corpus. Yet after Warren's death, the tunnel project stalled. Oxford City Council refused to grant planning permission, citing the engineering challenge posed by a tributary of the Thames running under Merton Street. Warren died in 1928, the year after he made his will. His trust, which had been invested in the United States, plummeted in value when the stock market crashed the following year. By the time the fund had recovered and it was possible to apply the money to its intended use, everyone had forgotten about the tunnel. In the 1960s, however, when holders of the E.P. Warren Prilectorship sought to lecture to all students of the university, including women, in explicit contravention of the terms of Warren's bequest, the college had to make application to the Charity Commission and ultimately receive the assent of the Privy Council to amend the college statutes to remove the gender bar. And now our very own Constanza Gutenka, who became the current Prilector in 2014, is the first woman to hold the position. So when I was a student at Corpus several years ago, the tunnel had sort of come back into people's awareness as the stuff of legend, um, as did other, I think, somewhat homophobic, honestly, jokes and stories about Warren's sexual relations with undergraduates, for which I found no actual basis in the historical record, right? There was a lot of gossip about this long dead person um, that was basically unfounded. But to write Warren off as a kooky eccentric or a sex pest risks trivializing the significance of this story to our understanding of classical education in early 20th century Britain. The fact is that there were a number of men like Warren who lived comfortable and untroubled lives in England's elite educational institutions, their views unproblematic enough that those lives were largely undeterred by risk of scandal. And this is something to which Jennifer Englehart has spoken to in her recent book, Masculine Plural, Queer Classics, Sex and Education. And it also features centrally in my second book project, A New Intellectual History of Homosexuality in England from 1850 to 1967. Moreover, when we consider that the history of classical education and classical scholarship in modern Britain is a history of pederastic norms and values, and of how those were deployed to keep women, people of color, and working class people out of the discipline, we can link the history of the discipline of classics in productive ways to some of the ideas that Sebastian Matzner and Kaji Amin raised in previous weeks in this seminar. As Sebastian delicately wrote in the OCD entry that he circulated to us, quote, ancient literature with its recurrent depictions of sexual violence, incestuous desires, and eroticized minors raises important questions for the ethics and limits of the queer impulse to side with and celebrate the anti-normative. And last week, Kaji told us that he is writing against the idea that if we call something queer, we are thereby reclaiming it and calling it radical. Warren's deeply reactionary pederasty was queer in the sense that it came to seem increasingly marginal to, suspect within, and oppositional to the goals of institutions that were pursuing different pedagogical philosophies. But one would be hard pressed to regard it as a usable pass. I want to close by grinding an ax that I have often wanted to grind, but for which I have never really had an appropriate forum, but now I do, so you get to hear me grind it. In recent years, there has been an efflorescence of wonderful work about male homosexuality and classics in 19th century Britain. I already mentioned Jennifer's work and Sebastian's, and I'm also thinking of Dan Orles, Gideon Nisbet, Shane Butler, Jen Grove, I could go on. There's so much of this. There has, this has been so great and also so necessary in part because many of the men thinking and writing about homoeroticism and homosexuality in 19th and early 20th century Britain were closely attuned to classics, excuse me, to classics, and even wrote in the ancient languages, such that specialist knowledge is required to engage with the writing and we need classicists to help us translate and interpret that writing. And yet, most of these conversations seem to be happening without modern historians in the room. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from my paper today, it is not E.P. Warren's tunnel, which is usually the case, but rather that, that, this is the part I've put in italics in my script, having good Greek does not confer anyone a monopoly on 19th and 20th century British history. Warren's story is a story about Greek, but it is also a story about English charities law, the history of universities, 
women and gender, and the political and cultural moment of 1910s and 20s Britain. Historians are more than window dressing who come in to provide fun facts. And I know you all know this, but you know, I've had some experiences that suggest to the contrary, so I just want to underscore it. We can tell you why queer classics matters to the structures of politics, power, and money of modern Britain. Look at who our prime minister is and think about the importance of classics in this country. Not that he's queer, obviously, but you know what I mean. So I'd like to close today by making a plea to all of us, and of course I don't exempt myself from this demand, to work more collaboratively and genuinely interdisciplinarily, to share in each other's research questions, recognize each other's expertise, and learn from one another. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm so glad we could provide a space for that grindstone. Um, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Jennifer now um, for the response, which will go and we'll do our break, break just briefly after six, um, uh, as and when it feels correct, um, in order to give space for that, for that response. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Marcus, and, and thank you, Eleonora. Um, for inviting me. It's, it's great to be part of this. It would be lovely to be in Corpus, but it's, it's good to be part of this community here. And thank you so much, Emily and, and Mara, for really rich and, and fascinating um, talks. Your, your research is so interesting and you've raised such important issues there. Um, I'm sure the discussion today is gonna to be really, really fascinating. One thing that really came out of both both papers for me that I think is is incredibly important for for queer classics is the notion of communities um, the various women Mara was looking at had ideas of um, gender segregated sapphic communities and Emily's been talking about Warren's vision being very similar but on on the male side of thing and with a nice dose of misogyny um, it seems to me that that notion of community really matters for for queer classics um, so much of what people are are trying to do perhaps as their original sort of emotional impulse behind wanting to study queer classics in antiquity and queer classics in, in reception is, is find a community across time and space with others like them. Um, so that, that seems to me part of what's going on. But also, it seems to me that community is very interesting from, from the point of view of classics and queer classics. Things, things have changed quite a lot since the sort of educational um, world that Emily and, and Mara have been talking about. Um, so, you know, Emily's talking about um, two college presidents who are not by profession classicists, but given their class and their education, they were classicists in their training at some point. Um, and Mara's talking about, you know, large numbers of, of women who are classicists. Um, there was I, what I'm, I think I'm trying to get at is that there's something really interesting to my mind that's happened around um, upper class, upper middle class, middle class education, and so many people being classicists, but there being a world where only certain classicists can talk openly about that sort of queer element of, of their engagement with the classicists. And now we've switched to a world where, you know, you, you mentioned Boris Johnson, so let's go for it, Emily. Um, you know, the prime minister makes classical references and most of the country groans because they've got no idea what this elite Oxford classicist is, is talking about. But the position, you know, that there's so few classicists here, every one of us, if, if we define as a classicist, and we might not, um, <laughs> has been through a sort of alienated process from the rest of the world to some extent where we've had to justify our interest in this minority pursuit but we're living in a world where being able to discuss the queer more openly is is so very different from what was going on in the sorts of communities Emily and, and Mara's talking about I think this is thinking about um, <laughs> various institutional things. 
happens in, in with queer classic immunity that both of today's papers were were really getting at the exercise he had us um it was interesting to me to see that some people did some people didn't um what does it mean to self-define as a classicist now and in the past we're looking at how does that fit in with defining as queer or not um i think there's something really fascinating going on there um I also think Emily's provocations really important. Um, it's absolutely true that, you know, it, even if we define ourselves as classicists by saying we, we belong to this discipline, clearly to do the work we need to do, we have to be much more open to doing things in a genuinely interdisciplinary way. And I, I think there are various barriers to doing that maybe actually oxford is a place where there are fewer bar barriers than there are in some other places but there are definite barriers to doing that um and i'd i'd really like sort of looking to the future i i think this this seminar series is is one place that's breaking down those barriers that's giving a space for historians and classicists to come together and and also members of the lgbt queer community to, to come together it's it's not just sort of professional academics who are coming together here so this seminar series is one of those spaces that can really facilitate those interdisciplinary connections and, and conversations but it'd be really great sort of going forward from this this brilliant seminar series if if we could think more about ways to to keep on facilitating those discussions i think it's it's really so very very important um the other thing that sort of really fascinated me with both of those talks was was the archival um in my own work on queer classics i found it really fascinating to to go into the archives um coming from a disciplinary background where there's a very limited amount of of evidence you know there's there's so little survives from the classical world um and it's so goddamn long ago to to be able to go into the archives and read <laughs> very recent um taking a classicist sort of perspective, <laughs> very recent documents about people who lived recently um, and, and grappled with queer classics has been, it, it's been a really emotional experience for me. I, I've been surprised how, how often I've found, you know, sitting there in the archives to be massively emotional. And I, I think that's probably a, a reaction that a lot of classicists share because we're so used to everything coming from from such a long time ago. So I think one, I mean, um, Mara was talking about um, questioning our own biases and thinking about where we're coming from as as queer classicists. And I think that that work in the archives, that working with a historical record that isn't, you know, 2000 years ago, but much more recent. I think that's something that that queer classics would really do well to investigate. I, I know work's being done in, in other disciplines um, on the effective element of, of the archive and how one, one engages with the archive, but I think there's perhaps something really interesting in a, in a disciplinary sense for classics and queer classics when it starts to engage with the archive. Um, and Marcus, you suggested that I, I should speak till around now and is now an okay time to take a break? That sounds perfect. Yeah, if you're, if you're happy to, to wrap up then, then that would be amazing. Thank you so much for, for those incredible responses. Um, to all of the kind of questions raised and for linking some of those themes brought out by both of those talks, setting us up for the discussion after the break. So I think we'll go for a, a five minute break now.
Um, so we'll be back just at 10 past six. So again, like a sh slightly shorter break this week. Um, if you need longer than that time, please feel free to take it um, in order to stretch your legs, in order to, to do anything you need to, to, to stand, to move around, to grab a drink of water, any of that stuff. Um, and we'll see you back here for those of you who are able to um, at 10 past six. Thanks everyone. <laughs>